chapter 1. Brethren, I give thanks to my God always for you, for the grace of God that is given to you in, in Christ Jesus, that in all things you are made rich in him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that nothing is wanting to you in any grace waiting for the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who also will confirm you unto the end without crying in the day of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Gospel. <clears throat> Taken from St. Matthew chapter 9. At that time Jesus entering into a boat, passed over the water, and came into his own city. And behold, they brought him one who was sick of the palsy, lying in a bed. And Jesus, say, seeing their faith, said to the man sick of the palsy, Be of good heart, son, thy sins are forgiven thee. And behold, some of the scribes said within themselves, mm -hmm. He blasphemeth. And Jesus, seeing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Thy sins are forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then said he to the man sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thy house. And he arose and went into his house, and the multitude, seeing this, feared, glorified God, who had given such power to men. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. Your prayers are asked for the seminary year that is now beginning. The six new seminarians have just completed their, their re the first retreat, and uh, tomorrow, Monday, will be the breaking in for the seminarians, and then on uh, Tuesday the classes will begin, and then there'll be other international seminarians coming, possibly from Nigeria, Brazil, and the Philippines. Other, other vocations are going to Aubrey in France, who are strongly with the resistance. Every Catholic should be, because it's, it's defending the faith and opposing the, the liberalization and the modernization of the Catholic faith. We're not allowed to do that. So in Aubrey, there are also uh, vocations going there for the, to be brothers and to be priests. And they also have a boys' school. So any of you parents who can no longer really send your boys, there, there is a danger, there's a danger because a lot of the priests are just going with this direction towards the conciliar church. And, the, and if you don't fight modernism, you catch it. If you don't fight the conciliar errors, you catch it. You catch, it's like a disease. If you don't fight it, you catch it. And that's how it is. And we, we Catholics, we're in the time not of peace, but we're in a time of war. And we all must fight. Every single soul, as Our Lady of Fatima said, every soul will feel the crunch. Every soul will go through an agonizing of conscience because they have to make a decision to follow the truth or to go with the world. And so, anyway, pray for these new seminarians and the brothers that, among them too. Pray also for three priests of the society who are very sick. Father Cooper, Father Daniel Cooper, who has just been di diagnosed with cancer. Father Burfitt, who has a blood clot. He's in the hospital now. And also Father Hunter, who has some... Um, um, infection from his diabetes on his leg. So pray for these three priests and more seriously pray for all the society priests to wake up to the great danger 
that their priesthood is in and their faith is in and their souls are in. Because the priests are trained, like the Navy SEALs, the Navy SEALs are trained to do special work, special fields of battle. And they know, they got to know the enemy and they got to know the tactics and the strategy of the enemy better. And Society of Pius X priests have been formed to fight specifically modernism, which is the synthesis of all the heresies. And if they don't fight it, they catch it. And this is the great tragedy that we're living through right now. Vatican II B, the repetition of Vatican II that hit the Society of Pius X two years ago, when the general council, the, the general chapter is called through, overthrew the principles laid down by Archbishop Lefebvre. And we can truly say, and I don't, I don't think this is an exaggeration to say, the Society of Pius X has been hijacked and it is, it is doing now exactly the opposite of what Archbishop Lefebvre founded this to do, which was to hold the line to hold the faith, to hold the sacraments of tradition and fight vigorously and openly and publicly against the modernism of the, modern, the Vatican II popes who are leading many souls to hell and to fight the modernism of the diocesan bishops. And now since two, since two years ago, the new direction of the society is now to go to the conciliar church, to seek an agreement with these modernists who are destroying the faith. And because they want this agreement, and they are set to do it, and Bishop Fillet has signed on to six conditions binding the society in order to get this agreement. And as you know, ten months ago, six months ago, he was telling seminarians, that there won't be anything going on, everything is dead, all relations with Rome is dead. And then two and a half weeks ago he was in Rome discussing with these modernists. And the modernists came out saying from the Vatican press that the meeting went very well and the full reconciliation is on its way, it's just a matter of determining when. So, dear faithful, we are in a new phase of the war, and God is not pleased. He is not pleased with traditional Catholics. That's why he's allowing the shaking, because maybe we've become too comfortable. Maybe we've become too complacent, and we're not seeking to become saints. We're not seeking to conquer souls for our Lord Jesus Christ, to conquer this country for the reign, the social reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. We just get comfortable. And God is not pleased. And he has allowed this punishment on our dear society St. Pius X. Just as he has allowed the punishment on the whole Catholic Church. God is not pleased and he's about to punish this world very severely. And as Our Lady said in many apparitions, she's just holding back her son's arm as much as she can. And it's going to hit, and when it hits, whoa. The prophecies say, the living will wish they were dead. There'll be so many corpses everywhere. And the fire will come down from heaven. And these are not these are prophecies given from the mouth of the Virgin Mary. And we are in those days, and the sins that rise to God for vengeance, all the blood of millions of children that fill our streets after these abortion mills in the hospitals, all that blood cries to heaven for vengeance. And that's not to mention all the abortions through contraception, through the pills. So many millions. And then uh, the perverts. In Toronto they had their parade with Catholic people and priests and the bishops silent in these rainbow flag raising parades that uh, bring down fire from heaven. And in the United States as well, the bishops, uh, they all quote Pope Francis, who am I to judge? 
Pope Francis is leading so many souls to hell, and they just finished their uh, conference on the family, where they will permit now giving communion to people living in mortal sin. It's, they're just lost it. And God has put us in these times to fight. And if you don't fight, you're going to get swept away with the rest of the world. Wide is the road to hell, most travel thereon. Narrow is the path to heaven, and few there are that find it. And those who find it, you got to cut through a lot of brush. And those who find it, you got to stay on it. And in these days, the days will be shortened so that even the elect may not be shaken. And how easy we can be so shaken. So dear faithful, pray for all the society priests <coughs> and brothers. They need to wake up and they're in grave danger. Oh Father, you're exaggerating. No, I'm not. 2003, the priests of Campos, they were the priests formed under and ordained by the great Bishop de Castro Mayor who was at the consecration of the bishops in 1988 with Archbishop Lefebvre. And they, these two warriors were the only ones to stand up against all the wave of modernism and the Pope himself to defend the Roman Catholic faith of all time. And those priests in Brazil, they were strong, they were against the new mass, they were against Vatican II, they were preaching and uh, fortifying the faithful, they were attacking the modernism of the local bishops and the modernist popes. And what happened? The pattern is very repetitive and very similar. Bishop Rifan, he started to meet with the local bishops. And by the way, open brackets, there is a new communique from Menzingen, from Bishop Fillet, to all the priors of the Society of St. Pius X that they are now to start inviting the local bishops to visit the priories. It's laying the smoothing the ground for the agreement with Rome. Make no mistake. It's not bringing the bishops in to, to have a debate and convert them to tradition. No way. It's all with friendly smiles and golf clubs. And it's a total illusion. Close brackets. So Bishop Irfan, he started to buddy up with these conciliar bishops and priests. And then he went to Rome and was buddying up with the modernists in Rome. And then, in their dealings with Rome, he said, well, I think we can make an agreement, become canonically normalized, as if tradition is abnormal, as if, as if it needs to be recognized by these modernists destroying the church. And uh, they were promised, so was Labaru, so was Good Shepherd Institute, so was the, the, the old great rede redemptorists in Scotland, they were all promised. You can preach against modernism, and you'll have the right to criticize Vatican II. And you can even criticize the new mass. But you have to accept that Vatican II can be interpreted in the light of tradition. That's called, in other language, hermeneutics of continuity of Pope Benedict XVI, another modernist expression. <clears throat> so what happened to these good priests in Brazil, in Campos? Well, Bishop Rufan made the agreement, and they all thought, well, we're going to stay as we are. But it doesn't work that way, because the Archbishop Lefebvre was much wiser. And he said, once you put yourselves under these modernists, they will crush tradition. They will crush the faith. And that's what happened. And they started to be more and more silent, no more, uh, no more uh, attacking the modernism of the local bishops and the modernist popes. They had to be harsh about that. No more attacking the Assisi meetings and the ecumenism and the disaster of Vatican II. 
So more and more they started preaching about being nice and charitable and practicing virtues. Of course, this is not bad, but in a time of war, you've got to be reminded, you better fight or you're going to lose your faith. And so they all became castrati, they all became mush, and now these very priests have fallen. They have all concelebrated the new mass, some of them are saying the new mass with altar curls, giving communion in the hand. Oh, Father, that'll never happen to the society priests. You want to make a bet? You want to bet? In La Beru, in the monastery, Father Bruno was with the resistance in France. He put out a very good letter in the Recusant. In uh, uh, it's in the 2013, no, 2014 September issue of the Recusant. And Father Bruno describes the steps of how the monastery fell to modernism, and it doesn't go overnight. And it's little by little, and when Don Gerard, the, the, the abbot of the monastery, in 1984 he wanted to make an agreement. And then 1986 he wanted to make an agreement. And Archbishop Lefebvre told him, don't do that. It's Operation Suicide. It'll destroy the monastery and the faith. And he was very eager to be regularized and normalized and in good standing with the Pope, and normally that should be the case, but when the Pope is modernist, you have to oppose him. Just like St. Peter had to oppose, be opposed by St. Paul in public, with respect, but openly. So what happened? They made their agreement with Rome, they were promised they could preach against modernism, they could keep the Latin Mass, so all these promises, and one by one they drop. And the priests in the monastery said, well, we will never say the new mass. And Don Bruno, he says, because they put unity with their superior and their brothers before the faith, and because they put the personality of their superior above the faith, every one of them fell to concelebrating the new mass. And worse, Archbishop Lefebvre said, worse. It is worth our tears, that is, that is true. It is worth our tears, what's going on. We should all be weeping, really. But uh, that, in the, in the monastery, one by one, those, all those priests fell to the new mass. And worse, one of them wrote a defense on the heresy of religious liberty. Now, this is the heart of the fight. The Freemasons have long desired to penetrate the Catholic Church and that their ideas would, as they said themselves a hundred years ago, we will so infiltrate the Church, our ideas, our, our principles will cover the dome of St. Peter's. And one of the big victories of Freemasonry is what's called religious liberty. What is religious liberty? Without going into big definitions, it's very simply this. The religious, the religious liberty treats Jesus Christ, the King, the way Barabbas treated our Lord Jesus Christ. Pontius, but the way Pontius Pilate treated our Lord Jesus Christ. Pontius Pilate put Barabbas on an equal level with truth. Error in truth, the lies with truth, darkness with light. And that is the modern governments that put all the religions on an equal level and treat the true religion like it's equal to the false ones. To treat the true Jesus Christ, the true God who became man and died on the cross and rose from the dead, victorious, to put him on an equal level with the, the Muslim perfidy, the Jewish infidelity, and all the heresies of Protestantism and Lutheranism and so forth. So that is the, the greatest blasphemy against God, to put the state being neutral on matters of religion. That is a heresy condemned by the church constantly. And that's what religious liberty means. Religious liberty means 
the attack against Christ as God and, and, and Christ as King. And that's why it's such a serious crime, such a serious heresy. And that's why when Bishop Follet signed on that religious liberty is reconcilable with the church's tradition, every one of the priests should have risen up and said, you don't have the right to betray the Catholic faith the way you've done with your doctrinal declaration. And yet, the priests are silent. In La Barou, they all fell. Campos, they all fell. Um, the Redemptorists in Scotland, they all fell. And the Society of Pius X has fallen. It's not going to fall. It has already fallen in 2012 when Bishop Follet signed the Doctrinal Declaration, the General Chapter Statement, the Six Conditions, and it shows up in his letter to the three bishops who told him, don't do this. It's going to be the death and, and confusion of many souls and the loss of many souls. And then, of course, on top of that, all the expulsions, Bishop Williamson and many good priests, and silencing of many good priests, who are simply trying to defend the position of the Archbishop. So Bishop Follet, he overthrew the decisions of Archbishop Lefebvre, never to make an agreement with Rome till Rome comes back to the faith and tradition. Bishop Follet did not listen to the general chapter of 2006 that said, never, make, will, never will we seek an to quote, an impossible practical agreement without first the conversion of Rome to tradition. That was tossed out the window. He did not listen to his own three bishops who warned him, don't go this direction, it'll cause confusion, division, and the loss of souls. And fourthly, he contradicted himself. Because 10 years ago, Bishop Follet said, we must never make an agreement with Rome. And now, he's shaking hands with these wolves. And as Father Ringrose said, oh, what mighty pretty teeth you have. And the wolves in Rome said, yes, the better to devour you with. What mighty big ears you have. Yes, the better to, to, uh, trap you and deceive you. What mighty big eyes you have. And Rome just laughs. And these Freemasons who are cardinals, they know what they're doing. And so that's why the resistance exists. The resistance, what is it? We're just Roman Catholics who don't want to compromise our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have the right to compromise our Lord Jesus Christ. We have to rise up like the Vendée in France, like the, the Belgian and Flemish rose up against the, the Masonic armies in France. We have to rise up like the Cristeros in Mexico who persecuted the church and pushed the same ideas of religious liberty and the crushing out of Christ's kingship. And we, we have to rise up like, like the... Well, there are a few gray hairs in these pews. And I know these gray hairs, they had to rise up against their parish priests, against their local bishops, against their Catholic schools. They had to rise up to defend the faith and go to mass in hotels, in bars, in living rooms, and fire halls. And now for you youngsters, welcome to the war. It's about time you wake up. It's about time you pick up the weapons for which you were confirmed. Because we are in a new phase of the war now. It's Vatican IIB and it's hitting the SSPX and the faithful are going right with it. Just like Vatican II, most of them went with it. And the clergy, most of them went with it. And Father Pfeiffer, I'm sure he's told you, and Father Tim and Father Joe, they grew up in, uh, with Father, old Father Hannafin and Father Urban Snyder. One was a Trappist monk, and the other was a parish priest in Louisville. And uh, 
These priests, living in, at the Pfeiffer's place, where now the seminary is in Boston, Kentucky, they saw hundreds of priests come through. And Father Hannafin would say, look, just stop saying the new mass, stop following this bad council that's taking souls to hell, and come and say the traditional mass. Or just start saying the traditional mass, start a new chapel. And the priests would say, no, I'll lose my pension. I'll lose my reputation. Uh, the bishop will kick me out. I'll lose my health insurance. And Father Hannafin and Snyder would say, forget all that. You're, you're a priest of Christ the King. Forget all that. He'll take care of you. Yeah, but, but. And uh, Father, both Father Pfeiffers saw some of these priests in tears. They just didn't have the courage. And that's what's happening. And the priest who should be standing up, Father Violette, who's now the pastor here in Richfield, Father Violette, remind him of his great letter that he wrote in 2003. And try to find that letter. You can look it up, you'll find it. It's a great letter. It's exactly what the resistance is saying right now. And in 2003, Father Violette wrote a tremendous letter saying, Campos sought an agreement, it was Operation Suicide, they compromised on the faith, they should not have done this, and so forth. So remind him of that. See what he says. But pray, pray for all the priests, dear faithful. It's, it's very grave what we're going through. And why is it grave? Because why are you Catholic in the first place? Why are you Catholic, little guy? And you little girl? And you old folks? Why in the world are you even Catholic? What makes you different from everyone else in the world? What is it? You dress the same, drive the same cars, you eat the same plastic food, and, and enjoy the same plastic entertainment, and live the same plastic life, and but what is it different about Catholics? The mark should be the charity, obviously. But it's the faith that makes us different. And is the faith some, some belief that evolves out of our feelings? No. Faith is what we believe that is revealed by God. Because God really spoke through the prophets. God really became man. God really taught a doctrine. And he really warned us, if you don't believe this doctrine, you're going to go to hell forever. And our Lord, to show us that he's not joking, that he really loves with, it, with, it, with the heart of the, the eternal God, each soul, and he's not playing games, he really was brutally crucified for each soul, for each soul on earth. And open the gates of heaven. And he told all of us, if you believe and are baptized, you will be saved, if you keep my commandments and so forth. But if you don't believe what I teach you, this Catholic doctrine contained in scripture and tradition, taught in our Baltimore Catechism, and all the traditional councils defended by the church all down until Vatican II where they, they tried to destroy the faith. If you don't believe this, you will be condemned. And that goes for me as well. If I was to sign that doctrinal declaration, which Bishop Fillet signed and the assistants and gave it to Rome, and this document is not dead. This document is alive and kicking. This document <coughs> surrendered more than St. Peter's, Campos, Labaru. They didn't accept the new code right off the bat. They didn't accept the new oath of the uh, profession of faith of 1989 off the bat. They didn't accept the new mass as legitimate off the bat. But Bishop Fillet signed on to this. And dear faithful, if you or I sign that doctrinal declaration, 
you would you would compromise against the Catholic faith. You would betray our Lord Jesus Christ. And I know if I signed it, I'd go straight to hell. Because I know what it says. And I know it's all this modernist, ambiguous language, accepting Vatican II in the so-called light of tradition, accepting <laughs> the new mass as legitimate, accepting the new code of canon law, which contains all the heresies of Vatican II. The new code is so serious. It allows communion to non-Catholics. It makes those non-Catholics who marry Catholics, they don't have to promise to raise the children Catholic. And so forth. The, the list is long, and I'll, I'll give you some of them. So, dear faithful, welcome to the new phase of the war. And just like the Catholics of 50 years ago, they had to read, they had to pray, they had to decipher and discern. And you've got to do the same. You've got to do your homework. You have to do your homework. Now, listen to what Archbishop Lefebvre said. I'm going to quote some words from him. Because Bishop Follet signed on to the, with the doctrinal declaration. He accepts the, the new profession of the faith. And Archbishop Lefebvre condemned it. Here's what he says. The new profession of faith, which was written by Cardinal Ratzinger, explicitly contains the acceptance of the Vatican Council and its consequences. How can we accept it? He said that in 1989. Archbishop Lefebvre writes in his book, Spiritual Journey, page 10 and 11, the errors of the Council and its reforms remain the official norms consecrated by Cardinal Ratzinger's March 1989 profession of faith. In other words, it accepts the errors, the heresies of the Council. Vatican II. Archbishop Lefebvre, this is what creates a conflict for us. Because, for example, at the same time that Rome gives the authorization to say the Mass of all time to the fraternity of St. Peter, or to the Abbey Monastery of La Barum, and the other groups, they ask the young priests to sign a profession of faith through which they must accept the spirit of the council. It is a contradiction, the Archbishop says. He also says it is a very grave act because it asks all those who have rejoined or who could do so to make a profession of faith in the Council documents of Vatican II and in the post-conciliar reforms. For us, it is impossible. So why did Bishop Follet sign it? Archbishop Lefebvre condemns it. Why did he sign it? And all the priests are blindly trotting along, going with it. Archbishop Lefebvre, this formula of the profession of faith, such as it is, is dangerous. This well demonstrates the spirit of these people with whom it is impossible to agree. Impossible to make agreements with these modernists. And now we know Bishop Follet is on the verge of the full reconciliation. And you know what? Most are going to go with it. It's easier. It's less hassle. And our Lord is demanding of us, do you love me more than these? you love me and my doctrine? Are you willing to follow me to the cross? Now, the new code, which Bishop Follet also accepted, with no distinction. Listen to the Archbishop Lefebvre, what he says about the new code of canon law. Because the society of priests have forgot this. Bishop Follet has forgotten this. And accepting this, they're going to slide right into the conciliar religion in the new mass, and many are going to lose their faith. Already, we know this past summer, two Society of St. Pius X priors, priors, left their priories, one of them in a pair of shorts, a t-shirt, and his luggage, to go to the Navasoto parish. Another one left in France to go to his Navasoto parish. They are thinking logically. If Bishop Follet wants to go with the new church, well, why are we, what are we waiting for? Let's go. And they went. In their Bermuda shorts and all. 
Listen to what Archbishop Lefebvre says about the new Code of Canon Law. March 1983. So, what are we supposed to think about this? This, well, it's that this new Canon Law is unacceptable. The new code no longer asks a married Protestant Catholic couple to sign a commitment to baptize the children as Catholic. It is a serious violation of the faith, a serious violation of the faith. In the new code of canon law, there are two supreme powers of the church, and this is what's called uh, collegiality. One, there is the power of the Pope, who has the supreme power, that's Catholic teaching, but two, the Pope with the bishops, that's the new doctrine. The Pope and the bishops buddy up together and they're another power in the church. <clears throat> this has never been seen in the Catholic Church. It is thus to limit the power of the Pope. So the explanatory note of the Council practically has no effect under the new canon law. Archbishop Lefebvre, the Apostolic Constitution introducing the new canon law explicitly says on page 11 of the Vatican edition, quote, the work, namely the code, is in perfect accord with the nature of the church, especially as been proposed by the Second Vatican Council. Moreover, this new code can be conceived as an effort to expose this doctrine, that is, conciliar ecclesiology and canonical language. In other words, the new code of canon law is Vatican II on wheels. It's Vatican II in practice, as Pope John Paul II himself said. Archbishop Lefebvre continues, This new code, it is the authority of the Pope and of the bishops which is going to suffer. The distinction between the clergy and the laity will also diminish. The absolute and necessary character of the Catholic faith will, will also be extenuated to the profit of heresy and schism and the fundamental realities of sin and grace will be worn down. And then he talks about how they no longer define the church as the pope, the, the, the bishops and the priests and the faithful, professing the same faith, same sacrifice, same sacraments. There's a new definition of the church, and it's called the people of God, with no mention of the clergy, and so Archbishop Lefebvre says, there's no longer any clergy. What then happens to the clergy? It is consequently easy to understand that this is the ruin of the priesthood and the laicization of the church. This is precisely what Luther and the Protestants did, laicizing the priesthood. It is consequently very grave. You know that the new code of canon law, canon 844, permits a priest to give communion to Protestants it is what they call Eucharistic hospitality. These are Protestants who remain Protestant and do not convert. This is directly opposed to the faith. Archbishop Lefebvre Conference in 1984. What else does the, does the new code have? A Protestant concept of the church defined as the people of God, the two supreme universal powers in the church, the Pope and the Pope with all his buddy bishops. And that's why the Popes dropped the triple crown of the tiara. And Pope Paul VI gave it to the, the Freemasonic Jews in B'nai B'rith. He gave the crown of the Pope. And now he wears a mitre to be another bishop like the other bishops. Collegiality at all levels. A laicization of the church. That is, lay participation. So lay participation, especially in the liturgy, the ladies reading the epistle and the gospel, uh, married deacons and so forth. Ecumenical practices in particular, Eucharistic hospitality. The new causes for nullity of marriage. So excuses to dissolve the marriage bond. New regulations in contracting marriages. Easy granting of annulments in marriage tribunals. Suppression of the major orders, the subdiaconate, the minor orders, and tonsure. That's all gone with the new code of canon law. The new canonizations, and now, they're, now Pope Francis wants to beatify <coughs> Pope Paul VI. Pope Paul VI, who lied prostrate before 
uh, Orthodox schismatic bishop. Pope Paul VI, who told the United Nations, you are the last hope of mankind. Forget Christ the King. Man will redeem us. And by the way, Pope Paul VI, when he died, his body stunk so bad after the first day. The guards were passing out. They had to cover his body with plexiglass. And the total relaxing of dis disciplinary laws and so forth. How could Bishop Willey sign on to this? How could any Catholic priest sign on to this? And the, and the accepting Vatican II in the light of tradition, accepting the new mass as legitimate, and accepting religious liberty and ecumenism and collegiality. Everything we have fought against, he has caved into two years ago. Where's the reaction? And you might roll your eyes and say, oh, oh, hum, this is all, this is all matters of doctrine, it's all matters that pertain to the priest, it's not our business. Well, dear faithful, it is your business. Because on these doctrines hinge whether you go to heaven or hell. And if you believe in religious liberty and start practicing it, you will lose your faith. If you start adapting to the conciliar errors and heresies, you will lose your faith. And you will go with the rest of the world, contracepting, no more children, divorcing, <laughs> remarrying, the whole spirit of the world, and raising your children godless, with all their gadgets, but godless, without prayer, without sacrifice, without the love of Christ, without daily rosary, without understanding the war we are in. And this is what's happening. The faithful are sleeping. The priests are no longer preaching against the heresies of Vatican II now attacking within the SSPX and everybody's going to sleep and when that final agreement is publicly announced you can bet they'll be singing the Te Deum we're finally recognized recognized by who? recognized by a whole pack of Judases what's that? that's why the Archbishop said we're not systematic we don't need to be recognized by these destroyers of the faith. We hold the faith until Rome comes back to the tradition of the church. We hold the line. And it's going to be down to a very few. As Anne Catherine Emmerich said, there will only be about 200 priests left on the earth that have the, still the true faith. And the faith will be kept in small pockets throughout the world. Cardinal Pia Poitier said the faith will almost be extinguished from the face of the earth. And that's what they want. So what are you going to do about it? Well, it's already a big step that you even come to mass of the uh, terrible, monstrous resistance priests <laughs> for which many people have been refused communion, which is another huge abuse, refusing communion because you go to a resistance mass or conference. It's incredible. So, dear faithful, it comes down to the, the basic truths of our catechism. Is our Lord Jesus Christ God or not? Is our Lord Jesus Christ King or not? And we know He's God. We know He's King. Because He has said it. He has proved it by countless miracles. He's fulfilled all the prophecies. And on top of that, we've got the tons and tons of miracles of incorrupt saints the Tomb of Guadalupe, the Shroud of Turin, the Eucharistic Miracles. And you can go on and on and on forever with this. <coughs> so dear faithful, pick up your swords of battle, the sword of the Spirit. And you too, little girls, God wants you in this war. You have to fight in the way girls can. And the, what Our Lady especially asked for was the rosary and sacrifices. And, and you've got to do your homework. And little children and youngsters, don't be one of those who say, oh, how boring, catechism class. Oh, how boring. we got to learn our religion class. No. No. St. Athanasius, you know who taught him the Catholic faith? 
You know who taught him the religion? The same catechism you're supposed to be learning? You know who taught him? It was all these Catholics, one of them had his eyes gouged out, one of his hand was cut off, one came in on crutches because his leg was cut off. They were tortured for the Catholic faith. That's who taught him the faith. And he rose up against Pope Liberius and all the bishops of the world, even the emperor, to defend Christ as God and King. And it's the same thing now. So dear faithful, pick up your weapons and the great weapon of the rosary and, and study, pray, read, look up the recusant. There's some great articles in there that tell you about this crisis. And in this sign you will conquer. And uh, some of the letters of Bishop Williamson and uh, the sermons of Father Pfeiffer, Father Giselle, of course the French and Brazilian priests, well, they're, 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 unless they're translated in English, but uh, some of them can be. And, uh, but you've got to read. And read, especially you men, read They Have Uncrowned Him by Archbishop Lefebvre. He shows what Vatican II is all about. And it's our fight now. Read, they have uncrowned him. And read all the books, the works of Archbishop Lefebvre. He saw all this. And he was no liberal. And uh, in 1988 he said, from now on if Rome wants to discuss, I will say it must be on the doctrinal level. And he said, I will ask the Pope and the bishops, do you believe in Pius IX's syllabus of errors? Do you believe in the anti-modernist oath? Do you believe in Pascendi of Pius X and Leo XIII condemning of separation of church and state? Do you believe in Christ's kingship of Pius XI and so forth and so forth, down to Pius XII? And he said, if you don't profess this, then no discussion, no agreement possible. And that's what Bishop Follet should have stayed with. Had he done so, God would have blessed the SSPX. It would be growing and expanding. But now all that's taken a turn. So dear faithful, persevere. And let's pray to the Mother of God, the Virgin Mary. She will defeat the dragon. She will have her hour. And as things get worse politically, economically, socially, and things get fall faster and faster to destruction, we know that means her triumph is closer. So battle on. And let's go now where the King of Heaven comes down right on the altar now. The King of Heaven who knows the battle we're in. He will strengthen you with his divine fire. You will eat his precious heart of Jesus, the glorified body of Jesus. You will drink his precious blood like a sweet wine that will strengthen you in this combat. He is the king. He doesn't send secondary agents. He himself comes. And he doesn't feed you crackers from his table. He feeds you his heart, his own blood. What a king. What a God. No pagans even dreamt of this, as St. Thomas Aquinas. And the true God so loves us, so fights with us, and if we're faithful to his mother, we're going to be faithful to him, which I ask in this Mass, she grants you to the day you die to obtain the victory of heaven. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.